seeing as this is our first major public event uh, in the new year, I don't think it's uh, uh, out of you know, course to wish you all Happy New Year. And we still are you know, pretty, pretty close to it. Um, I think you probably know many of you from um, my background, my wife Judy, who's sitting here uh, right down in front of me. Uh, we spent uh, many, many years in the Foreign Service of the United States and ended our careers uh, in Georgia, uh, not Atlanta, Tbilisi, uh, in the former Soviet Union. And uh, during the three years that uh, we were there, uh, I really came to understand and appreciate firsthand um, how serious uh, and how difficult it is to try to deal with the problem of corruption. Um, Georgia is a very old society, very old culture, with only very recent experience uh, in national independence, really since the end of you know, the breakup of the Soviet Union. And uh, corruption, as you probably know, was rampant throughout the former Soviet Union, but the corrupters, if you will, were the uh, Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Uh, when it broke up, uh, the corruption you know, took different forms, and uh, our, our speaker today will certainly cover that. But in Georgia, what we found was that corruption really began to permeate uh, the whole society. It was choking business, it was choking the development of the government. And uh, very, very clearly, uh, the fight against corruption and, and the disgust with the old system was a major reason why President Shevardnadze was asked to uh, leave office. He resigned, but uh, it was because of this uh, popular uh, revolution called the Rose Revolution. Um, and I'll never forget, um, in September of the year 2000, President Shevardnadze came to Washington to meet uh, President Clinton. And I had, the, as the American ambassador, the privilege you know, to be in on that meeting. And I'll never forget about, uh, we, we were briefing President Clinton before the meeting about you know, Shevardnadze and what was going to be on his agenda. And it went very, very well. But then about 30 seconds uh, you know, before the meeting ended, uh, an aide came in and said, you know, Mr. President, President Shevardnadze is waiting for you. President Clinton turned to me and he said, Mr. Ambassador, he said, what's all this I hear about corruption in Georgia? <laughs> and I said, Mr. President, I said, we've got 30 seconds. And I said, I, I simply, you know, it would be almost impossible. I said, the only thing I can tell you uh, for sure is that corruption, you know, permeates the whole society. In a way, it's almost how the society is organized. And he looked at me and he said, you mean you can't just throw a few bad people in jail? I said, I wish it were that simple. And he just kind of shook his head and he said, hmm, you know, interesting. Uh, but anyway, that, you know, sort of, uh, as I said, you know, was a, a real dr a dramatization for me, again, how difficult it is uh, for uh, non-citizens uh, of that part of the world to understand, you know, how serious and how pervasive uh, a problem it is. Uh, and here today we are extremely fortunate. Uh, I can think of no one else in this country or anywhere uh, who is better qualified and better able uh, through a lifetime of work spent on studying, you know, crime and corruption and, and the threat to democracy uh, than Professor Louise Shelley. Uh, I say this knowing very, very well because we have known, Judy and I have known Louise for about 30 years already. We go back uh, to being in Moscow together in the mid-1970s when the, when the corruption was, as, well, as I said, from the old Soviet system uh, personified. Uh, but uh, more recently, uh, and I, I've, we have you know, stayed in touch over all the years, and Louise has had just a, a simply brilliant uh, career uh, in the field of, of criminology and, and studying organized crime and corruption. And what she does that is so unique um, is she's looking at it from a research perspective, you know, sort of how, the why, you know, wh what can be done about these things. And as a result of her work individually and her creation uh, of a center called the Transnational Center on Crime and Corruption, uh, which is at American University uh, in Washington, they are now the only such center, you know, in the United States that is devoted, you know, to the study of this very, very serious problem. 
which as I said, in, in my own humble judgment in a place like Georgia was the single greatest threat you know, to the uh, ability of that country to make a successful uh, transition. Louise has been a prolific writer of books, articles. Uh, she's been a presenter you know, on television. She's very frequently a speaker at conferences, both here uh, and abroad. Uh, she holds a PhD in sociology from Cornell University. Um, I'm sorry, from the University of Pennsylvania. Her undergraduate work, uh, cum laude, was at, uh, was at Cornell. Uh, and as I said, she's a wonderful person, a very, very dear friend, and I can think of no one, as I said, better qualified to address the subject. Louise, the floor is yours. What a, what a lovely introduction. And Ken worked for a while. Um, at the Transnational Crime and Corruption Center, which he didn't mention because we were working in Georgia and I didn't know enough to do this because it's unbelievably complex. And he helped work with me and design research that's going to be published, I guess maybe this year or next year in book form on, on this issue. But I think the anecdote he just told you about President Clinton and the corruption issue is one of the major reasons that we're at this problem internationally with corruption being a threat to democracy. As, as Ken said, as ambassador, I mean, this was the central issue that he dealt with in state transformation in Georgia. But it was left for the last 30 seconds of a briefing when it's a problem of such complexity, <coughs> such importance, and such centrality. And one of the problems that we have internationally today is that people seem to think of it as the peripheral issue, something that you bring up in the last 30 seconds of a briefing when it is the something that should be the heart and core of what we're understanding in, in many, many parts of the world, including some of what's going on in the United States. And I feel, I feel fortunate in that I started looking at this subject matter in the former Soviet Union, which it was when I lived there, a one-party state. But I've worked in other parts of the world, but having a base in a society in which this is such a central part of, of state political social transformation has given me insights that are useful in understanding this phenomenon elsewhere. If we think that it's only a problem over there, organized crime and corruption as threats to democracy, then we're being narrow-minded. Established democracies, especially those dominated by one political party or system, are rampant with corruption. Think of Chicago. Think of New York. Think of some of the urban areas in the United States that have long-term histories of crime and corruption. They are one-party you know, one states. And I was just telling a group of students at lunch, I was in Chicago where I was invited a few weeks ago to do some distance learning on this issue, and the person who had invited me was someone, was a former organized crime uh, cop, but also a PhD, who was taught, so he had the practical experience and the <coughs> research side. And he wanted something to be taught on this issue because what he was seeing in Chicago and the imp impact that organized crime was having on the legislative process and the enforcement process and the development of Chicago was, was central. And there have been recent scandals in major European countries, Spain, Germany, France, that have really shook citizens' faith in the political process. And then, those, there are countries where this is just a constant problem, like Italy, which has, goes from one political scandal linked to corruption, linked to organized crime, to another, and Japan, where there's not enough written on this and not enough focus, but where you're dealing with one of the largest and most powerful organized crime groups that is very much linked to the political system and to the problems of why Japan continues to be in an enormous recession. 
Um, so it's a problem in established democracies and in developing countries. It is a problem, especially those are kleptocratic. I mean, there are problems of corruption in most developing countries in the world, but there are some where it's a particular problem. I was just talking earlier about the case of Riggs Bank in, in Washington, where $150 million of the resources of Equatorial Guinea were found. Um, I mean, that's you know almost the whole national treasury that has been picked up and laundered into the United States. So corruption is a, is a problem in the developing world. But it is particularly acute in undermining democracy in two other types of societies. One is the transitional society in which um, Tanya Lutz was talking about of Georgia in the transition away from a one-party system that existed under the Soviet Union it's true in, in all the successor states to the former Soviet Union. Um, it's true in South Africa that is in transition from apartheid <coughs> to trying to be a more democratic society where there are more types of organized crime that are operating out of South Africa which try to democratize its police to institute greater safeguards and to do that had to get rid of its apartheid police. And now you've got everybody in the world operating in South Africa. And it is acute in transitional societies away from one party domination. And it's one of the particular problems that Mexico is facing. Um, it had a problem of organized crime that was severe. In the last president of Mexico, Salinas's brother was implicated in major drug trafficking, hundreds of millions of dollars of illicit funds were found in his bank accounts in Switzerland. And it is this legacy and this institutionalization <coughs> of crime and corruption that is making the Mexican transition to a multi-party state more difficult in derailing these efforts at, at greater democracy. And then we're also finding corruption and organized crime being particularly acute in areas of conflict. So that's why Ken, when he was ambassador to Georgia, had a double whammy because he had a society that was in transition and a state in which the central state had lost control over Ossetia, um, Abkhazia, Ajara, conflict regions, and it's in conflict regions in which crime and corrupt officials often prolong conflict for their own personal benefit. We've been doing research um, that Ken helped design in Georgia, looking at the smuggling operations that are going on in some of these conflict zones. And the, the leaders are making so much money out of this, they have no interest in these conflicts being resolved. But this is not just a case, and as I'll talk later, in Georgia, it operates in Africa, it operates in Asia, and it's one of the phenomena that has been particularly acute in the, in the post-Cold War era. Because many people talk about the rise of organized crime being linked to globalization, greater transport, greater movement of people, and that's part of it. It's an important part of it, essential. But transnational crime goes back to the mafia in the 1920s in Chicago and New York that was constantly being replenished by people coming from Italy and people going back. So it's been transnational for over a century, not only here, but Chinese organized crime. But what has happened with the end of the Cold War and the end of the superpower conflicts is that you've gone from a, polar, you know, a bipolar world to a world with regional conflicts. Hundreds of conflicts have broken out in the last 15 years. And it is in these areas organized crime and corruption are so prevalent. Because how do you support a conflict in an impoverished region? You trade guns, you trade people, you trade drugs, anything that you can do that are going to help you buy arms. You trade diamonds. And this is part of the reason also this 
outbreak, this of regional conflict that has led to this enormous rise in organized crime. And as we've seen, if you're an expert in any part of the world, how intransigent most of these regional conflicts are. Someone asked me, well, maybe you'll give a prediction on what is going to happen in Iraq um, after the elections. Well, I think that one of the things we have to understand is that there's not, elections can sometimes be irrelevant in a state where organized crime controls an economy. And Afghanistan, I think, is a prime example of this at the moment. Maybe we had successful elections in Afghanistan that uh, <laughs> adhere to rules of democracy, of multiple candidates, of lack of coercion at the polls. But what we have is an economy now that where 60% of the economy in Afghanistan is based on a drug trafficking economy in which the warlords who are controlling large sections of Afghanistan are supported by a drug economy. And it is not in their interest to increase rule of law, to increase democracy and controls, because that will then eliminate their major financial source and the way they survive and maintain their paramilitary armies. So we've had elections in Afghanistan, but we're certainly not having a transition to democracy because an illicit economy prevents this. Look at, th at the former Soviet states. And I should have started off with my anecdote of one of my most memorable experiences from my travels. We've run a project not only in Russia, Ukraine, and Georgia. And in one of the centers of organized crime for the last century has been Odessa. There's this part of New York City, for those who know it, called Brighton Beach, which is also known as Odessa by the Sea. But if you want to look at, read the history of American gangsters in the United States, Jewish gangsters, many of them came from Odessa. So it's got, you know, it produced musicians, it produced comedians, and it produced gangsters. And there's a wonderful literature by a, a great writer who died in the Stalinist camps named Isaac Babel, who immortalized these gangsters. So there's a, there's a good tradition to deal with. And when you have organized crime, you've got corruption. So we have an organized crime study center in Odessa. It's very, you know, you've got to go where the problem is. So we have the rector of the University of the National Legal Academy in Odessa, where our center is based. And he assumes a new position this summer. He becomes head of the Central Electoral Commission. You may have heard about the Central Electoral Commission in the last few weeks with the Ukraine elections that certified the phony elections. <laughs> so I am staying in the guest house of the National Legal Academy. And one day I come back to my room. And as I come into the grounds of this little guest house by the Black Sea, there are a bunch of Mercedes there. I mean, like one Mercedes after another Mercedes after another. And I come upstairs to the second floor where my room is, and I see the table in the second floor laid out, which a bunch of people that have stomachs out to here. And they look like, if you know Russian literature, there was a, a great 19th century Russian novelist named Gogol, who wrote The Inspector General, and he wrote a book on dead souls where you had dead people voting. And he really captured the co corruption. And I've seen plays of it and Russian presentations of it. And these characters, with their sort of drunken, swollen faces, their bellies out to here, look like a scene out of the Inspector General. And the, I, I'm trying to run off to my room to uh, uh, avoid this drinking excess with these very unpleasant looking people. And the rector of the university, who's head of the Central Election Commission, tells me to sit down. 
And so I sit down at the table with these people and listen. And he says, well, I'm having her here because I'm get, we've got this grant from the Ministry of Justice and understand that I'm not totally on the Russian side, that you know we're having an election and I'm not weighing in between Yanukovych and Yushchenko, either though the West wants Yushchenko and the Russians want Yanukovych. And what is clear going around this table is that there is some give and take and they're putting enormous pressure on corrupting the head of the Central Election Commission. And the, and then after they go, I meet the mayor of the city of Odessa, who, you know, is Mr. Crook personified, who's also come out to make his case that they really need Yanukovych and links to Russia and the privatization of the economy. And when I'm introduced as the head of this transnational crime and corruption center, their first response to me is, well, what are we going to do? We can't steal, steal the money for the highway construction if you really clean things up here in the road construction. All right, so this is, you know, this is corruption at work. But what happened? You know, we have just had a major crisis in Ukraine because my host, who was, I was sitting next to, Mr. Kivalov, certified phony elections, which led to massive protests in the streets and you know, and contrary to what many people would predict, you know, a declaration by the courts that these elections were fraudulent and a parliament supporting this, and a new round of elections that led to the eventual inauguration of, of President Yushchenko. But here I am seeing corruption of the electoral process at work and what it does to democracy by the same, you know, same people. So this is, you know, this is it. This is, this is how corruption and organized crime undermine democracy. I've never seen a clearer illustration played out in front of my mind saying, you, you cannot let this election go to Yushchenko. It is your job to take care of this. Then I've been, I get to go to the ni nicest, most interesting places in South Africa. I was taken to a, a lovely vineyard and shown pictures of the owner of the vineyard, who was a Russian dentist who happened to have the same name as the chief of staff of the Kremlin. And in the photo album was pictures of him with every top South African official, some of them who had been indicted for arms trafficking and corruption. So, you know, this is undermines a political process. And in Mexico, uh, the, the deputy attorney general who was prosecuting some of this organized crime was just sent into exile to save her life. So the, this is not a theoretical problem. Uh, this is a very real problem that organized crime and corruption undermine electoral process, undermine rule of law, undermine you know state's use of resources, and lead to you know, numerous bads. And it is organized crime that helps lead to the perpetuation of conflict. In the Caucasus, it's smuggling, whether it's smuggling in flour, smuggling in cigarettes, smuggling in alcohol, you name it. That's what is buying weapons and allowing the conflicts and these frozen conflicts to continue. In West Africa, it's now referred to as blood diamonds because so many people have died. In Colombia, huge amounts of territory are under the control of guerrilla groups that have formed coalitions with drug dealers to fund and sustain their conflicts. In Sri Lanka, if you've looked at some of the charts that have been in the paper after the tsunami and looked at the regions that are out of the control of the central state, those are regions under the control of the Tamil Tigers, and they support themselves internationally through drug trade. And all of this, the incentive, the financial incentive, makes the resolution of these conflicts much more difficult because there is an economic incentive to perpetuate these conflicts. 
And over the last year or two years, I was part of a, of a World Bank project, research project, that started off at looking at what it was called greed and grievance, and what is it that leads to the perpetuation of conflict. And they started off you know, looking at ethnic issues and diaspora community support, and wound up where I get a call one day saying, would you please pair up with a Russian econometrician so we can do an economic analysis of this and look at what is helping to perpetuate the war in Chechnya and the very high level of violence in Russia. And one of the things that we found is that there was so much illicit trade, siphoning off of oil and other kinds of illicit smuggling that was helping to perpetuate the conflict in Chechnya. So what we're looking at is a pattern, and one of the reasons that the World Bank had gotten into this is that they were finding that this illicit trade was a major obstacle to economic development and to sustainable political development of societies. So it's no longer just a crime problem. It is something that is really becoming a central economic and also political problem. When you think about this impact of organized crime and corruption, um, there are numerous implications. Look at this question of the electoral process and how the elections were just fixed by the head of the Central Election Commission in Ukraine. But that's just <coughs> one case. We could go through numerous cases. Um, in, in Colombia, the former president Pastrana of Colombia had his campaign manager in prison. The campaign manager was the son of the most famous artist in Colombia because the campaign manager for the electoral campaign was the conduit between the drug traffickers and the coffers of the presidential campaign. So you can imagine what that does to the electoral process <coughs> when you have drug campaign, drug money funding electoral campaigns. You have the administration of justice undermined with police and courts that are corrupted. One of the favorite movies I've shown to my um, undergraduate classes are you know, Public Enemy and Scarface, 1930s movies of organized crime in Chicago. And there's a wonderful scene of Al Capone being hauled off from the police who are just beating him up uh, because his lawyer has paid off the judge and gotten him off. Well, you know, that, that hasn't ended in Chicago, and it exists um, everywhere today um, internationally. Uh, there's hardly a place in the world that has, you know, a totally honest police and court system, and there's some parts of the world um, where the police are actually running the crime activities, where they have totally merged. Um, one of the places we've been doing research on in Russia is in Kazan, where we, the research team set off to look at the relationship between the police and the criminals, and when they were finished, they found there wasn't a relationship between the police and the criminals. There was a criminal organization, and the police did some parts of the activities that were needed, and the people that were identified as gangsters did other parts. Um, you know, in Mexico, you've got police buying positions. Many years ago, on my last Fulbright to Mexico, I was teaching in a human rights institute that shared a building with the Policia Judicial, the, the federal police of Mexico. And the first day of class comes and they all line up with their SUVs. This is about 12 years ago because the drug traffickers have bought them not only their cars but their positions to go into the federal police. I mean, this is what, you know, can you, and then, I mean, just to give you not to be anecdotal, but th these people are not enforcing the law. They are a source of fear to the population. So one day, I mean, I'm interested in Mexican art, so I went down to see the Orozco murals, and they 
asked me, I wanted to go see a museum of pre-Columbian art in a part of the city that wasn't so safe. It was a museum set up by Diego Rivera. So they, my section of the institute asked me to be taken there by, be escorted by a member of the Policia Judicial. And I'll never, this is another one of my stories that illustrates this. I'll never forget, you know, the first thing saying, oh, you're, you're teaching human rights. They're trying to tell me not to torture people. And then the next thing, I see the guard, the young girl of the guard, absolutely being terrified by the, by the policia judicial, who she's worrying is going to rape her because they're totally immune from any prosecution and had been involved in, in many, many cases of, <coughs> of, of rape in Mexico. So that, you know, what does this do to citizens' faith in the legal process? when you've got the legal system taken over by the criminals. Uh, in terms of the legislative process, one of the things that we can talk about of whether it's Chicago, where I was learning about why the Chicago or the state of Illinois has many, many less laws against organized crime than the rest of the country, because we have federal laws against organized crime and we have state laws. And in order to effectively prosecute in our system, if you can't you know, sometimes d use federal law, you need a state law. And Illinois, because of organized crime pressure on the legislative process, doesn't have laws that it should be having on how to prosecute organized crime. So if you think of that in our city of Chicago, you can think what it's like in a transitional society like the former Soviet Union that didn't used to have private property. And now as the countries of the post-Soviet state try to introduce laws against offenses connected to private property, and you have legislators who are members of organized crime, then you have a great impediment to you know, the introduction of the legal framework that you need. I mean, think about the situation in Ukraine. The former prime minister of Ukraine has been prosecuted in the United States for money laundering and theft of hundreds of millions of dollars that have been found in his Swiss and American bank accounts. And the Yanukovych, who just lost in Ukraine, was an individual with two criminal convictions. This was not somebody who was a dissident in the Soviet era and was prosecuted for you know, crimes against the state. He was prosecuted for armed robbery, banditry. I mean, he was a thug. So if you're having a prime minister who's a thug, you have a problem in getting introduced the legal framework that you need to develop <laughs> into a democracy. And your state apparatus if it's run by organized crime, is going, you're going to have trouble licensing your business, registering, anything that, that requires some function of the state to perform equitably and fairly. And most critically, and someone may think about this as an economic issue, but I think it's also important as a political issue, is the distribution of property rights. When you have an unfair privatization, which is what has happened in much of the world in the 1990s, then you have the enrichment of an elite and the impoverishment of much of the population. And when people are impoverished, they don't have the time or the freedom to exercise their political rights. And privatization, you know, may work, this we can debate, you know, under Thatcher's Britain, where you have rule of law and a legal system that works. But when you have privatization in Russia, or privatization in Mexico, <coughs> or privatization in Colombia, you don't have equal access to privatized property. Because either you've got individuals who are totally corrupted, who are corrupting the privatization process. And if money doesn't work, then violence works. And so you've had in, 
in Mexico, in Colombia, in the whole former Soviet Union, privatization to a criminalized elite. And in, in many of the countries of the former Soviet Union, and particularly in Russia, um, you've seen this and talked about this, and you can understand a bit more about the oil and gas situation, but you've moved from a society that had you know, relatively limited uh, income differentiation to a country in Russia in which one or two percent of the population is enormously wealthy. There are more billionaires living in Moscow than there are in New York City. And about 10 percent of the population that is middle class. So if too many people are concerned about their day-to-day -day survival, they can't be active members of civil society, they can't participate in the political process, and, and I think this distribution of property rights has an enormous impact on it. What are the consequences of organized crime for the development of a state? One of the things that when you talk about, you know, what is a state, the state is supposed to have a monopoly on force. It runs the police, it runs the military, uh, the state is supposed to be in control. But in an organized crime state, where the state organized crime has penetrated the police, where it has criminalized the military, where people can be victimized by organized crime and have no legal recourse to any state protection, state loses its monopoly on force. And you have impoverishment of citizens. It undermines their ability to be active participants in civil society. Um, if you look at what has gone on in Mexico with privatization there, there's a wonderful sort of, there's some that you can read, but not a, enough, um, documentary called Money, Murder, in Mexico, which looks at what happened to privatization under the corrupt Salinas government that was also involved in the drug trade. And much of the businesses that were privatized <coughs> went to corrupt individuals close to the party. But it isn't just that they were corrupt. Some of these individuals are also some of the major drug traffickers and money launderers in, in Mexico. And with that, you have had an impoverishment of the population because there isn't resources being invested and it is contributing to a large part of the problem of underdevelopment in Mexico, illegal migration to the United States, and we can go on and on and look at some of the consequences of this. And you have citizens and residents of a society outside the protection of the state. At the moment in the United States, we have something like nine million illegal immigrants in the country who don't have access to justice. In Western Europe, I was just in, in Paris last week, there's something like 600,000 Chinese living in Paris at the moment and taking over whole quarters of the city where they know that they're being physically exploited in, in sweatshops there, but they have no access to, to legal services, to any kind of protection of their rights. In Japan, I was at a conference on human trafficking um, and it was, it was fascinating. It's such a sensitive issue that the Japanese don't like to admit this. They think, talk to about being a democracy and protection of their citizens' rights and, and what a you know, middle-class society they are that looks after their citizens. But there are visas given for foreigners to enter and reside in Japan, and about 170,000 of these visas are given annually. 70% of them go to women who work as entertainers in Japan. And most of these women are, are, are trafficked into Japan for sexual exploitation. And as the person talking to us in the conference on the migration service says that he has had so many death threats by organized crime as he's tried to intervene and these women have tried to get the protection <coughs> of the state because they've been so violently abused within Japan. So even in a society that is democratic, 
like France, like Japan, like the United States, you have individuals outside the protection of the state. When you have organized crime penetrating the state, which is the case in many, many countries in the world today, the citizen is left totally helpless. And citizens lose faith in the state and its institutions. I would also say that when I first started studying about the Soviet Union, we looked at problems of authoritarianism, communism. But organized crime, in many ways, represents a new form of authoritarianism. You have non-state actors, because that's what organized criminals are, so they're outside the state, but they're so closely linked with the state that they are enforcing their will on citizens. So what is the major, you know, if you talk about freedom of the press as being an essential part of democracy, what is the greatest reason that journalists are killed? Yes, report on, on corruption, report on organized crime. And if you look at the society to protect journalists, the greatest number who are killed annually are in reporting on corruption and organized crime. So what is that? That's a new form of authoritarianism. It's organized crime undermining freedom of the press. If you look at labor exploitation, it isn't some, um, you know, multinational corporation that may be, you know, keeping people, you know, in difficult circumstances, but the worst exploitation is going on in the sweatshops running by organized crime by people who have been smuggled, enormous labor violations. Um, it's a form of authoritarianism also where people lose their access to the legal system. Very profound implications that we've seen and, and, and Ken Yalowitz talked about in, in Georgia. It undermines national security. When you have a corrupted law enforcement, a corrupted border control, corrupted military, corrupted peacekeeping, anything can cross your, cross your border. Um, you have, you can traffic in nuclear materials, you can traffic in, in arms, and it, it undermines not only the security of the country in which this is occurring, but has international consequences. And it can make the state more vulnerable to terrorism. If you've got corruption at the border, you can easily move people across territory. And, and people also who are disgusted by this corruption, there is a, a window, an opportunity, as we're seeing in many Islamic societies, for institutions to come in, schools that replace what the state is not doing that has been corrupted, and schools move in and propagandize for a you know, radical form of Islam. So we're having part of this rise of, um, of terrorism is also linked to the failure of, of states to provide basic social services to their <coughs> citizenry. So corruption has an organized crime, a terrible impact on the state. It's also fair to look at and necessary to look at what happens to democracy as states react to organized crime and, demo and, org and corruption. And it can also undermine democracy. As Italy went off to, in the 19, 1993 when I was living in Italy, there was a major investigation of corruption that was going on called Mani Puliti, clean hands. And thousands of business people were rounded up, who were subject to corruption investigations, and sent to prison and confined for a long period of time. And since that time, for the last decade, there has been a very heated discussion in Italy of whether the judiciary has become too powerful. And this is one of the things that President Berlusconi, who's been mired in his own corruption investigations, has been doing, has been leading attack against the judiciary. But it's certainly true that in that decade, 
there has been an enormous swelling of the power of the judiciary, and that helped diminish what you would call the balance of power. You had a swelling of the influence of the judiciary relative to other parts of the, of the governmental structure. You have enhanced authoritarianism. One of the things that has happened in Russia in the last six months is that after the terrorist attacks on the planes in Russia um, by the women suicide bombers in the end of August and Beslan, you've had the Putin government engage in centralization of authority, tightening authoritarian controls, and much of this was done by Putin saying there is massive corruption in Russian society. The terrorists couldn't have you know, bribed their way onto the airplanes. We need to fight corruption. One of the major consequences of this, and I think will have enormous impact on Russian state <coughs> development, is that when you crack down in a society in which the police and the courts and the legal system are corrupt, you're, you're not providing a state in which you're going to be developing sound political institutions, encouraging international investment, but you can have enhanced authoritarianism as a reaction to organized crime and corruption. You're going to have more limited citizen participation in the state. You can have, as occurs in many parts of the world, you know, you uh, pick up and read about anti-corruption investigations. Well, that person may be corrupt, but the person who's prosecuting them may also be corrupt. And you're using anti-corruption campaigns as a way to target political enemies and not to enhance the rule of law. Georgia may be a prime example of this, but it's not the only place in the world. And crackdowns can provoke a terrorist reaction. Um, you may be surprised by the example I'm going to give you on this. But in the 1990s, 1992, 93, when the Italian government really began to prosecute organized crime in Italy in a very effective way, you may remember that the mafia bombed the Uffizi Museum and the Lateran Church, which is the second church in Rome after the Vatican. So you can have a terrorist reaction as a result of a state reaction against organized crime. There are, you know, these relationships are very, very complex, and I don't think we think enough about this interrelationship between organized crime and terrorism. So um, that concludes my formal remarks, and one of my concerns to talk to finish on this issue of terrorism is that I think in September, post-September 11th, when we've had such a single-minded focus on terrorism, we have failed to pay sufficient attention to the problems of organized crime and of corruption and what they do to state development, political development, economic development, and social life and societies. And originally when I talked about, you know, what I would come talk about here um, at, at Dartmouth, one of the things that I work on is human trafficking. And I haven't even mentioned that practically at all except on human smuggling. But one of the things that you have is not only abuse, you know, horrible abuses of human rights, but enormous demographic consequences for a society that loses citizens um, of childbearing years. So there are just enormous ranges of consequences that one often doesn't think about. And in this, someone was saying to me in the beginning of the talk, well, one of the things that people, they talk about every night is the war on terrorism. And I think the war on terrorism has dis detracted us and distracted us a lot from understanding how crucial these issues of transnational crime and corruption are for economic, political, and social development internationally. And they are going to be decisive issues in the 21st century. And we just I just read a national 
um, intelligence report by the National Intelligence <coughs> Council on 2020. And there is some discussion of organized crime. It runs for about a page in a 100-page report. And much of the discussion is on, you know, on 20, 30 pages is on terrorism. And I think that it is this, you know, unilateral focus, rather than understanding these important linkages, that is going to cause us, you know, problems in the coming future. Because these issues are very, very important in shaping not only our world, but that in which we live. Thank you. that I don't think that our, our military is thinking enough about, and I'm not just saying this as a, you know, as an ordinary citizen, because teaching at a university as I do, which is much more engaged in public policy than, than Dartmouth, um, I, I'm working with people in the, in the military who are doing this. And in fact, one of my students is supposed to go out and oversee you know, military intelligence in Iraq. And his dissertation with me has been on you know, the mistakes of peacekeeping in the Balkans and how we didn't understand the centrality of the organized crime and corruption issue to peacekeeping and state development in the Balkans. And having that made that mistake once before, we've made it again in Iraq. And that one of the central obstacles we face in peacekeeping in Iraq is that transnational crime is a very major problem there. It's not just terrorism. And that there are very close linkages, just as there have been in the Balkans, between transnational crime and terrorism. And the first sign of this that we've had was that if, if you think about the raiding of the archaeology museum, and the ability to enter there, steal treasures, and move them internationally. It, it took intelligence. And it's very, very interesting um, process, is that just as post-Soviet organized crime has been very much affected, its capacity, the reason that it is such an enormously successful organized crime is that it has been able to exploit the security personnel that were part of the Soviet system who have been incorporated into the intelligence structures of organized crime. And in a few months ago, I was at a dinner with a, well, someone that Ken also knows, who had just come back as governor of the southern um, half of Iraq, who had been BCM of Pod in Moldova, had extensive experience in Russia, and said this was the most, the best preparation for him in Iraq, because the, the Iraqi system, most, much of the personnel in Iraq had been trained by the Soviet Union. So this Ba'athist security system was heavily influenced by the, the security system of the Soviet Union. And this is not only our top Iraq, Iraqi specialist at our university, who's a, a Syrian, has also made the same point. So what you're looking at is the privatization of the state security apparatus into an organized <coughs> crime activity that is linked, helps funds, helps provides the logistics for, for terrorism let alone you have enormous corruption there and enormous corruption going on in our peacekeeping, order maintenance, and so forth. I mean, sometimes I meet all kinds of people through my work that are not just academics. I, I, I have a very sort of colorful life. 
And so one day I get this, you know, call from somebody who I'd met at a security meeting, says, I want to have dinner with you. Please meet me. And I come down, and he's overseeing the security of the green zone in the airport in Baghdad and starts telling me, I mean, the, the, the whole, logi he, whole logistics of it, starts telling me about the enormous corruption that he is seeing within the contracting and the collusion. And, you know, I'm, I'm just sitting there. You know, it's nothing, nothing that anybody's reading in the newspaper. I mean, there are little bits and pieces flowing out. So what we're having is an enormous merger of a privatized security force that's turning into crime, merger of crime and terrorism, plus domestic compounded with international corruption. And under that, I mean, if we're seeing problems in Afghanistan, I don't know, I mean, you can be optimistic that things are going to democratize, but to me, that's a formula for instability. So I, I'd not, you, you can have an electoral process, and this person who is, you know, um, you, know, you, can, you can run an election, just like the, this contractor's not only running security <coughs> for the green zone, they're running, you know, electoral process in Afghanistan. But, you know, what's the point when your, your actors in the society don't have the interests of the state in mind and the perpetuation of conflict? What's, what's so interesting in the Iraq situation is that you've got the ideological um, interests of the terrorists merged with the criminal interests of the people engaged in the smuggling and the arms. And what we're, we're seeing increasingly, which um, is something that is our, our most recent research that we're doing, is that, and I, and, and I agree, disagree with this National Intelligence Council report, which concludes that organized crime and terrorists are not really going to work together in the future because they, you know, it's an opportunic, opportunistic relationship and that organized criminals are interested in money and terrorists have political objectives. But that's a, that's a primitive way of thinking about this. In, that's a world based on the mafia and Japanese organized crime where you have a functioning state and organized crime has enough money that invested for the long term and want some stability. In a world in which you're looking at of a conflict region, neither the criminals nor the terrorists want state stability. They, they benefit from the incapacity of the state. The criminals benefit because there's no one to crack down on them, and they're not interested in a strong state unlike the mafia or Japanese organized crime, that make a fortune benefiting from state contracts through their work in the construction industry. Or we could talk about you know, the mafia in this country and garbage collection, wastes. Well, when you need a state that functions, the kind of new forms of organized crime that we're seeing, such as Ken saw when he was ambassador in Georgia, are people who are not the least bit interested in the state. The less there's an effective state, the more they can function. And it's that where they converge with the terrorists where neither of them are interested in state stability. And it's this where there's a convergence and where you see where it's hard to detect where the criminal stops and the organized uh, and the terrorist <coughs> ends. It's just like what just happened in Northern Ireland where the IRA is involved in bank robberies, maybe not to support terrorist activity, where there's, there's not a fine line between them anymore. And they can merge and go between these different roles. And that's, we've found a lot of this in our research in many different parts of the world. And so our biggest challenge is how to present this intellectually. I have one article coming out on this very soon. But there's just so much more to say on and I think the implications for Iraq are very frightening, apart from what we're seeing. Yes? I, I'd like to kind of 
encourage you to look historically, a little bit of history, at least to uh, put some perspective on what you're saying. 1993, I took part in a meeting at, uh, in Washington with people from the CIA, the FBI, Treasury, and a whole bunch of other interesting kind of groups. And the, um, at that time, um, somebody said that the three biggest transnational threats, both to the United States and elsewhere, um, and to the working of democracy at local levels, um, in, were China, uh, West Africa, and Israel. Not as states, of course, but because of the demand of the languages of uh, people who were in these areas that made it impossible to find anybody clean to do a wiretap or anything, and levels of use of computers at that time, which was much more sophisticated than the highest levels of encryption that one person said being used in the United States government at that time. Passwords changed every 72 hours with five levels of encryption. Now, my question is this. Uh, I just said what the three major kind of threats to organizing these things transnationally were in 1993. I can make a couple of guesses, but I'd rather hear from you working on these full time. Where are the major uh, centers today, the sort of switchboards, to use an old metaphor, uh, uh, for transnational organized crime to bring together people from localities so they can do interesting things like get antiquities from Iraq and the market at the right place at the right time? I would say, you know, that it's very hard to, you know, map. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say I agree with that assessment on China 10 years ago. I think it's much, with China's opening its borders, it may be more true today than it's it was. people today. using Chinese more than anything. In Let's just say East Asian Chinese. That is a, a, just a slight invitation. Um, if, if you want to look at one of the things that you need, need to do to facilitate organized crime and terrorism is the ability to launder money. Mm -hmm. And Riggs Bank, Bank of New York. Can you name some other good ones? <laughs> I would say, and the, the number one haven of money laundering is the United States followed probably by London. So if you want to look at, you know, where is a, a haven for organized crime, I, I was just saying before the lecture facetiously that if, I, I'm telling my class, but I don't know if it's a safe thing to do, that I could take them 15 minutes walk from our classroom at AU and show them three, you know, look, foci of money laundering, the house of the person who uh, owns I was president of Riggs Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the house next to me that is, I, I believe, laundered PLO money, which the, um, you know, which seems to be borne out by investigation, and, and Bulgarian money laundering uh, right across from the university. Those are just what I have uncovered, um, in, you know, or know it exists. Um, if you want to talk about what facilitates organized crime. And there's a, a very interesting report that's just been put out that Todd just sent me um, by the former Assistant Secretary of the Treasury and an economist. <coughs> you know, we have very little enforcement of organized, or of money laundering in this country. And as one of the <coughs> things that has happened since September 11th, is that as we have focused on terrorism, we've left this enormous window of opportunity for organized crime to operate. But if I'm taking what you just said, sorry, sorry but, but uh, just to, to follow on because of uh, what you're saying, uh, your three centers for laundering, which is so important to this, are in the United States. Not just, uh, there's Great Britain, there's Switzerland is still very, very important. Major financial centers. So what are you saying then about the, the priorities of these major democratic governments uh, 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 if they're unable uh, to do anything about these centers? Because, because I, I would like to have the confidence of saying that 
not at a criminal indictment level, but at least at the level of knowing about these centers for transactions, there seems to be a lack of political will to do anything about it, which we have seen before. Yes. Uh, arm transfers for uh, various interesting substances between, uh, 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 between Central America, uh, United States, and Iran, for example with the full complicity of the United parts of the United States government. I mean, one of the, the concerns I have about fighting organized crime is that we keep talking about, you know, we've got to do something about, you know, the problems of organized crime in Georgia or Uzbekistan or some, you know, some other poor country that doesn't have capacity. But if you're looking at what it takes to make this operate, you need facilitators from the developed world, from the financial centers, the lawyers, the accountants, and there was a lot more we could do. But the political will and the consciousness of how this is being facilitated is, is not there. And as we crack down somewhat more on the financial centers, you're moving money into real estate, into art markets. Um, I was recently in London talking to, the, to an art dealer who's about to head the Association of Art Dealers in London, telling me about the massive amounts of money laundering going through art in Britain and France these days. Um, when you could think of it, I mean, Iraq is just a piece of this. Um, so I wouldn't say it's, you know, it's the Chinese, it's not, it's something, there are much more that we have to be focused on, on what is going on in the developed world and the mature democracies and how they are facilitating this. Um, and I'm not gonna say it's going on in Colombia and China or in those languages. A lot of it um, could not thrive in the global community without the support of what is going on in our societies. It's not, we're too globalized. It's not just their, them versus us, which is something we, we like to think about. So you would put it back in the United States. If you were to look at three places, it's interesting because I was talking more, I guess from an intelligence point of view, about the ability to do transactions where you just don't have people able to you know, break into your communications. But what you're doing, if I'm following you, is looking at the real sophistication that you need to move the things that you want to mm -hmm. organize crime networks. And you're bringing it back, to, if I'm thinking of your PowerPoint presentation, to, uh, to the very developed democracies themselves, and a point at which the developed democracies, uh, uh, I'm trying to put it as a lawyer would, would uh, uh, in the interests of allowing you, if you possess a great amount of wealth, to protect the wealth in your privacy, uh, to shelter large amounts of money and the means of moving that money from the public gaze, for good reasons. I mean, somebody, again, from Treasury once said to me <coughs> that uh, uh, the United States has no problem at all with taking huge amounts of money where one does not look into its provenance from Russia. Uh, uh, it may have been legally extracted from someone, putting it into our banking system. Our only concern is drug money and terrorism money. Outside of that, you're free to do what you want. Uh, do you see any shortcomings in that point of view to protect the privacy of people with a lot of money to move around? I wouldn't, I wouldn't even say sometimes it's a, it's a privacy issue. Well, let me give you a, a very some of it is an ethics issue. Mm -hmm. um, let me give you an illustration. One of our projects that can help me in design was the, the current ambassador to Georgia said, you know, this economic sabotage that we're having in the flour industry, we're having so much flour being smuggled into Georgia that it's, and 50% of the food that's consumed by Georgians are bread products. That, <laughs> Would you please investigate this flower smuggling? <coughs> so, from the Georgian side, we investigated what we could of the flower smuggling. But then, I was asked occasionally, 
I, I do the practical side of my work. And I was asked and hired by somebody <laughs> to, who had been hired by a Swiss bank that had a suspicious bank account with a Muslim name. So they thought, from Russia, they thought it might be terrorist money. So they thought they'd better look at it. <laughs> and strangely enough, this was the missing piece that helped answer the question about Georgia. Because it was a very high government official whose son had this multi, multi-million dollar bank account in Switzerland. And he justified the presence of this money by saying he owned agribusinesses. And the names of some of these agribusinesses turned out to be linked to the same trucks that we saw involved in the flour smuggling into Georgia. So you could, do, so this whole sort of economic sabotage that was going on against Georgia, which Ambassador Miles had told the Agriculture <coughs> Secretary that he thought this was linked to some very high official in Russia, which it was, was sustained by you know having this multi multi million dollar cushion in Switzerland. Recently, I asked the people I did this due diligence for work for, what happened? And the Swiss said, well, they decided they weren't going to the bank that this count wasn't terrorism, so they di it didn't place them in such a vulnerable position, and they didn't do anything about it. All right? And this bank account should never have been taken. If you had put that name of that person in a Google search in English, you would have come to our website and track, as well as numerous other sources, and seen that this guy could not have been, was just up to here in corruption. So, you know, it's, it's not a simple situation anymore in, in unraveling this corruption. And if this information had not come to me from a Swiss bank that was trying to, to, to see whether it absolutely had to get rid of this account. Uh, I never would have been able to you know, finish the puzzle that I was given. I could only understand a piece of it. I could know what Russian businesses were involved in this smuggling. But how they were sustained, how they were politically linked, I would never know. And that's part of the problem of, of investigating it and part of untangling all of this. It is so complex, so tied between the legitimate and the illegitimate economy. There is so much money involved in it, so much financial interest of not only the people in the region who are seeing it, but in the developed countries that are profiting from it, that there has to be an enormous amount of political will to do something about it. And you know, by focusing on terrorism, you know, you're, you're giving the organized criminals an enormous free hand. Yes? Have you been, ever been able to, to uh, put a dollar estimate on the total cost or total proceeds of corruption? I know this is very hard to do, but I'm thinking of a case when I was looking at drug trafficking, narcotics trafficking, there was a figure that it was given to me, $600 million mm -hmm. uh, profit. And I don't know. Which, and it, it was the size, it was larger than some of the uh, prominent American uh, companies. The, the last estimates, I was talking about that in a, um, <coughs> one of my earlier talks today. There haven't been any really good estimates that I have seen done since around 1998. And those place the trade in narcotics alone at the level of the textile and steel industry internationally. But when you think about this issue, it's not as if it is equally distributed. <clears throat> so when you want to understand what are the political consequences of it, if you think that 60% of a small economy like Afghanistan is controlled by drugs, and what a locus and the consequences that come out of a country that's on the southern tier of the former Soviet Union, and the amount of drugs that is now flowing from Afghanistan <coughs> through the former Soviet Union to Western European markets, 
and this destabilizing factor of it, if, if you understand it in terms of you know, how much money you're talking about in Afghanistan, that doesn't give you the full weight of, of what its impact is within the international community. But it is enormously significant. Um, it is not a peripheral problem anymore. And it's not, um, and it is such an important part in the conflict regions that it has an impact and that's you know, more destabilizing um, than, than you would realize. Yes. You, you, you mentioned your, your website. Could you, uh, could you tell us uh, what it is? Oh, it's, I have some brochures here. But it's oh, okay. I, I, it, good, good it's question. on there. I can, I can pick that up. But just to... yeah. I, I have one other question. I have an amateur interest in Iran. I've traveled there uh, and uh, trying to tell people people contact is a little bit difficult given the uh, extreme problems between the U.S. and Iran right now. <coughs> As you run across you know, organized crime there outside of the mullahs, uh, outside of the big banyans uh, there, which I'm sure are pretty, pretty corrupt in their own way. Uh, but I was, I was just curious uh, on that side, given the, the strong control that you know, the religious authorities have there and, and a lot of corruption within that. I didn't know if there was any sort of separate question. Organized crime right. works the same way as business, right? So just like real estate, you, you think of location, location, location. I mean, I'm being, you know, I should be giving you a scholarly lecture, but some of, some of this analysis just takes sort of basic human smarts. And if you do too much theoretical thinking, you'll miss the basic human smarts. So let's just look at this. What country is to the east of Iran? Uh, Afghanistan, and there's a huge amount of, of, of drug smuggling there. Right. right. And so only parts of it are going through Tajikistan. Mm -hmm. There is still major intellectual breakthroughs that the notion of that past, present, future, which is vital, that finalism, is a myth. It's not true. When you were very little, you drew things the way they were. You drew words as parallel lines. I mean, roads as parallel lines. You drew double rows of telephone poles as parallel lines. Then some teacher taught you visual perspective and you haven't seen since that day. Because you, you see something you know is bullshit. You see the sides of these roads coming together in the distance. You've been taught to be blind, but we call people who do that past to protect you from the present. How do you live still in this new urban setting? You try to recreate institutions, whether it is the storefront church, whether it is the recovery of music, but all of that is an attempt not to live in the present, a way of resisting, so that you've got to let go that structured past, whatever. But now we've got this this problem since you know the, the rise of the prop is just enormous. What's going to go on um, in terms of the linkages between Islamic fundamentalism and the drug in, in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan? Um, this is just really a major international security. And Iran has a huge drug problem just in itself, too. No, when you have this much transiting, mm. when it's some, some, some of us are going to fall off the truck. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, as a final word before I thank the ladies, I uh, discovered a number in Georgia. This was, of course, before the, uh, the Rose Revolution. Uh, I had to go see the uh, Minister of the Interior very frequently because we had you know, issues of security of the embassy you know, that we had to talk to him about. And I would sit there and look at this guy in the eye, and I think to myself, it is amazing. Here's the chief law enforcement official of this country who's also the biggest crook. 
because uh, he you know, was a known fact, you know, pretty well that he ran, you know, cigarettes and booze and everything else. And, and he was and getting paid off to move Chechens yeah. across yeah. Georgia. Yeah. Exactly. So this again was a good example of how you know, terrorism and, and corruption came together. Thank you very, very much, Louise. That was terrific.